If Jesus, what are you doing, is the question. One question I think is pretty unhelpful and a source of great anxiety for students a lot is saying, Jesus, what should I do? So it is relational, right. but it's, it's, it seems like it's taking the focus off of God and putting it on yourself, which is inherently frustrating because we're not the solution to ourselves. We're making ourselves the focus. Does that make sense? That's right. Yes. Yes. I framed it in the form of a question just because the WWJD. No, no, but, but I, my, my point is like when, 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 when people, especially young people who have major life decisions on the horizon, ask Jesus, what should I do? What, how should they approach? What's a very good. As opposed to I go into the chapel. So, you know, God is Santa Claus That's is right. what you're talking about, where I need to activate something primarily by the way I conduct my life. Mm -hmm. And if I'm good, then he'll return good things to mm -hmm. me. So that's like a, one false image of God is God that's as Santa right. Claus. God as magic eight ball is I go into the chapel, I, I shake the magic eight ball, and mm -hmm. he tells me exactly what I'm supposed to do. And if I don't feel that, then I must be doing something wrong. That's right. And so uh, what's driving that, right, is this fulfillment and happiness is, is achieved, is experienced, by, uh, by my capacity to know, by my capacity to um, be able to, um, yeah, uh, knowledge is precisely what in fact um, brings me happiness. Um, as opposed to as opposed to the Christian vision, right, is being with God is precisely at the end of the day what all of this is about, right? It's easy for a priest to, to turn prayer into the way to get another homily. Yeah. <laughs> huh? God is the homily giver <laughs> and the collection inspirer. Yeah. Right, but imagine approaching marriage that way. Yeah. So, so, so at the end of the day, right, is Christian relational prayer is about friendship. Why am I praying? Do am I? Why am I uh, committed to prayer? Is it so God can tell me which college I should go to and which how I sh I should buy? Yeah. Or because I want friendship with Christ. I had a powerful experience of this just last week, um, giving this retreat. Um, as you remember, huh? Uh, if we humbly admit we've been in those shoes, that if I can just figure out what my vocation is and I just know, then my life is going to be filled with peace and everything yeah. is going to be taken care of, right? It's this self-reliant uh, impulse, this control impulse. Well, uh, I, uh, there were a lot of guys in, in that situation. By the end of the retreat, when they shared graces, several of them uh, mentioned that in this retreat, they were able to enter in and encounter the love of God, the presence of Christ, and that that was their security that was their peace. That's what they now wanted. I want you, Christ. I want to be with you. I don't want to lose you. And it's your presence that fulfills me. Being with you is what makes me happy. And many of them, I'm not making this up just because it uh, supports my point. <laughs> many of them said, I still don't know whether I'm supposed to be a priest or not. I still don't know if I should remain in this, how long I'm supposed to remain in this seminary, but I'm no longer anxious. Yeah. I, I, I am no longer tortured in my mind to answer this question. It's fine because I realized my focus is supposed to be about being with God in everything. Yeah. And when he wants to do that, and so it was, it was a profound example, lived experience of, uh, in the heart of a, a college, uh, college males of the, the very truth of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 
the, the kids today are much smarter in a lot of ways than I was when I was in high school, especially with, with this sort of language, right? I don't think, I joined the seminary right after I graduated high school. I don't think I used the word discernment once, That's at least right. maybe not until I sat down in your office. But <coughs> Shame on me. I, if, I, <laughs> if I was the first one to say that to right. you. I but actually did. This, I was vocation director for 11 years, I dis, and two of my least favorite words are discernment and vocation. Good. But that's, that's another episode. Go no, ahead. No, no, well, I think, that's where I'm going. <laughs> so with, I was sitting as a newish priest in, a, in my office, and a, and a young lady came in, and I, she had a question, I answered it, and I said, hey, have you ever thought about like, religious life? Have you ever thought of that as an option? And she said, I just, there's a lot of examples like this, but she said, yeah, I, I thought about that uh, when I was younger, and she's like 17. <laughs> yeah, I thought about that when I was younger, but I discerned that God isn't calling me to, to religious life, he's calling me. And I, I, I just had this cl clarity of mind, because it's such a sensitive thing that you don't want to question, and this That's is part right. of the problem is, yes. people say, I've discerned, then it's like, oh, then you, you can't touch that because that's their private relationship with God, and how could I say anything? And so I had this kind of like, this, this moment of clarity to say, are you sure that's what you discerned? And then we talked about it more, and then she went on, she went on this like nun run with me and whatever, and afterwards she says, Father, I have a confession. <laughs> she said, when I told you that, I thought about it for 10 minutes once in the chapel, <laughs> in my sophomore year, and I didn't, so. That, that's still true though for people yes. when they, they might give themselves years of time yep. of, of, of discernment, and uh, I, I guess I, I, I just had had this very strong experience that when people say they're discerning, even if they're sincere, even if they're actually giving themselves over to it, they don't necessarily even know what they're, what they're doing, right. like you said. And, they, and if you're not rejecting already yeah. the things that are to be rejected, you don't even know what voices you're That's listening right. to. They need people like you and me helping them. Right, and so if one thing, one, one professor talked to me once about uh, discernment language and students saying things like, I, f I felt peace around an issue. And he said, one of my nagging suspicions is that s students are, are feeling peace around things where it's actually a, a, a relief based on a fear yes. of, of a lack of magnanimity on their part. So, you know, I could go uh, fight in the Battle of the Bulge with, you know, yeah. the other people in my 18-year-old class against the Nazis, but I could feel great peace in discerning the fact that actually I'm just going to stay home and not have to go through that ordeal. You got it. And, and I call it peace, I call it discernment. So well, can you like shed some light? I know that you said that's a whole kind of episode worth of discernment, vocation, interior peace, consolation, desolation, the, uh, the big, but these words are just thrown out there so much. Very good. Well, as, as you know, Father Bauk, one of, one of the great, great privileges of my life, of my priesthood, was to be able to work with you wonderful, uh, so many who are you wonderful young priests in our diocese now, and many uh, wonderful laymen in our diocese right now who were in the seminary and uh, the Lord, uh, you know, drew them out into the married vocation. Your good friend, Austin Holgard, et cetera. My brother, Jerome. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and, and so it was, it was a, just a wonderful privilege to stand on that sacred ground because it really is sacred, as you're saying, this vocation. And how does one come to know? Because, right, we believe Christ is personal. He personally chooses, etc. Um, and if you remember, if you remember back when I used to visit seminaries and I'd sit down with each of you, um, one of my uh, routine, I wanted it to be a question every time I sat down with you, at least in major seminary, and I asked this question, where are you experiencing the presence of God? And if I needed to, where are you experiencing the love of God? Where are you experiencing the consolation of God? That was a common question that I wanted the seminarians to be able to answer because only in that space can one discern the will of God. Mm -hmm. You can't ask the elder son to discern his vocation. Exactly. 
He's going to, it's going to be a disaster every time. The elder son first needs to start engaging relationship with the father, where he starts experiencing the father's care for him. All kinds of new stuff starts awakening in him. And now, in this new space and experience of the father's love, he now starts to sense who the father has chosen him to be, who his identity is in the father. So, um, the, the biggest key for helping a person discern, a young person discern, is to help them identify the space in which God is speaking to them. In the most ordinary sort of ways. This doesn't need to be drama. This doesn't need to be right transfiguration moments, etc. Um... The, the more a person can start being aware of what we call spiritual consolation, not a false peace like you just accurately described, which is very common, um, but a true spiritual consolation within that place of spiritual consolation, God's will is, my will is attracted to what God is willing me. I'm receiving his will. My thoughts are his thoughts. My affections are his affections. I'm receiving from the heart of God. And so if in fact I've been chosen to be a priest, when I enter into spiritual consolation, understood rightly, not, not just uh, vaporous <laughs> feelings, um, but they're real yeah. and they're attractive and enjoyable, that's for sure, heartfelt, um, in a patterned way, it's being able to identify that space, being aware of what I'm attracted to there, what's giving me life, what makes me want to give myself away. In a patterned way, I come to now be able to have clarity on where the Lord is drawing me. But until a person has awareness on that level, they might not have the language to articulate it, to express it, and that's our job to help them. But for someone just to say, yeah, I discerned that, un until I become aware of, of that level, my nature, my nature will demand I get married. Right, celibacy only is something a healthy male should be attracted to if it is fact on a supernatural level, yeah. for a supernatural reason, for a supernatural vocation. Um, and so, uh, but uh, back, to your, back to your first question. The first question about discernment is about, can I tell you where I experienced God, uh, where I had a lived experience of God today in a meaningful, sp uh, specific way. So my whole conspiracy in asking that question was really determining the depth and the maturity yeah. of the seminarian's discernment. Because if you, in fact, have deep, uh, if you have mature discernment, you can speak with specificity yeah. about one's lived experience of God. He's real. I have a friendship. And he's a real person who really cares for me, who really relates to me, who really does things for me. Yeah. And, um, and so that's the, that, I think that is the first step one should always go to is helping, first of all, determining, can they even define this space where this is happening? And that, <laughs> I love talking to you, that's in here, because <laughs> the... That the, the idea that the, the elder son is not capable of arriving at a good discernment because he's filled with lies about who he that's, is, that's right. who God is, what God could call, like that God could call you, for instance, to unhappiness. That's <laughs> and right. So do I want to be unhappy or do, or, you know, and do God's will, or do I want to be happy that's and right. not do God's will? That's right. And spirit of pride could say, I got to be a priest. Yeah. Then, then, right, right, right. then people will really think I'm great. <laughs> yeah, and I can show them. The other thing, too, is... is sort of, uh, you know, not, they're spiritual, but like getting out of that discernment world sometimes and saying, 
w when I'm praying about a decision, yeah. for instance, yeah. to say, what's the maximum like of generosity that I could offer God? What's the, what's like the most that I could do for Him, out of out of a, a spirit of gratitude? To always kind of check because we have that because of concupiscence and fear, we're always kind of that downward lurch, right? To say we're being and we'll talk about sloth too, but but being drawn in on ourselves. And to say, wait a second, am I just being, you know, peaceful animus here, or am I honestly making an effort to give the most of myself that I can? Um, and I, I think that just keeps getting more and more uh, exacerbated in, in our time of 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 thinking that, you know, it, it's we talk about the the nominalist sort of thing, that this hmm. idea <coughs> that yeah, God see. is the God is like he he just does whatever he wants, and there's no real rhyme or reason to that. And so if I'm praying to a nominalist God, I have to just go show up and say, here's my life. I'm going to check that whole life at the door. And now I'm going to come in this raw soul of mine encountering your raw divinity. Your that, whimsical. That is pure will. Yeah, that's just pure will all the time. And now we need to communicate to each other. There's like, well, that's not how God works at all, right? When he called Peter and Andrew, right, he's, he's walking to meet him at their fisher, their fishing station, you know, that he meets us, like where we're at, talks, speaks in our language and, and communicates with us. And, he, he, you know, in, in the Gospel of John especially, he doesn't call Peter, he calls Andrew who calls Peter, and then Peter comes to encounter Christ. So God works through these very earthy, proximate causes, that the intermediate causes, uh, that of course we're also all all ca called to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what, one of, one of the primary interior experiences of relating to a nominalist God um, is is uh, first of all it's somehow right separated from my own fulfillment and happiness. Yeah. Right, that God's commandments are arbitrary. Yeah not for my good, yeah. um, and therefore, um, one, it's a catch-22, right? One quickly and easily can see God's will as that thing, God's will is always that thing I don't want, right? Yeah. God's will is always that thing I don't want, uh, which, is, which is absurd. And yet at the same time, right, the self-centered person can also have God's will is always my will. And so those two extremes um, have to be, have to be um, somehow exposed and talked about. But in either case, what they're, what they're lacking is a desire to be with God. Mm -hmm. And to see the fundamental vocation of every person and the fundamental fulfillment and what this is all about is friendship. So whether I'm supposed to be a priest or not, a married man or not, it has to be rooted in I have a friendship with God and he's drawing me to this. Right. And this is how I give myself to this friendship. Right. And it was so beautiful to see in seminarians when God was drawing them out to their married vocation. Right. This was not out of selfishness. This was not out of a lack of generosity. Yep. The same sort of, the same sort of holy attractions, magnanimous attractions that drew you and me to be a priest, drew them to that. And so, um, in that way, the the vocations are so similar. Right. But uh, this. This, uh, this moving in discernment away from the nominalist sort of approach once again comes back to being with, do I really want God? Yeah. Do I really see God as my joy? That is another great episode. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, to, I, I think we need to preach effectively about this, Father Balk. Um, I, uh, our faith formation, I'm teaching parents now every Wednesday, a different grade. And one of the things I'm just uh, really encouraging uh, the parents and kind of pounding into them with great love 
is for them to pound into their kids with great love that God is enjoyable. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more enjoyable than God. I don't think that rolls around in, in people very much. The average person sitting in the pew, if you were to ask them to describe God, how many, how many D scripts would it take for them to get down to, oh yeah, and by the way, he's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Right, if he isn't, then why heaven? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's because of this lack of this lie that somehow gets in, has gotten into uh, the human heart that God isn't enjoyable, which is the, the ground, right? The ground of what we call the capital sin of sloth. Yeah. St. Thomas, uh, which, dear people, you've probably heard there's a p pandemic these days. I want you to know the, the most, the pandemic of all pandemics today, in my opinion, is sloth. And it's going, and, and we don't diagnose it like, how often do you hear priests talk about sloth? Yeah. How many times? Yeah. M most of us wouldn't think, well, yeah, okay, sloth's one of the cats. But these others are the real. Um, I find sloth in many ways to be the root of so many other sins. I tell the, uh, I tell the Trinity uh, kids, if, if the capital sins played basketball, sloth would be a point guard. <laughs> It assists, it assists all the, all the others. St. Thomas Aquinas says sloth, right, is sorrow around spiritual goods. Sorrow around the fact that I'm supposed to find my joy, my fulfillment in God. And that makes me sad. Yeah. The rich young man. The rich young man was filled with sloth. Go sell, uh, go sell all your possessions and then come follow me. If he's listening to the Holy Spirit, right. that's great. You are my fulfillment. Yeah. But the spirit of sloth, which came from a heart other than God, spoke into that. Huh? God is taking something from you that he will not be able to compete right. with he will not be able to compare with. Somehow the joy you find in these, you won't find in him. And thus, what did it make the rich man, the young man do? Not relate to Jesus. Right. The whole, uh, and so the whole issue of sloth, which we have all been taught is uh, as laziness, is actually relational laziness. So sloth is really what makes prayer so hard. Father Bauk, sloth at the end of the day is what makes prayer so hard. Sloth is this, I don't want to have to put forth the effort to bring my heart to God, to bring my needs to God. Yeah. But what's underlying it, St. Thomas, of course, uh, everything he says is, is uh, True, right, Dominic? But, <laughs> but um, uh, what's underlying this sorrow is a lie that you and I, that is easy to believe that God is not enjoyable. And so when we are on our social media and the thought comes up, we should pray, there's this movement of sadness. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this movement of this is more enjoyable than prayer. This is the movement of sloth that needs to be overcome in order to enter into a, a real lively relationship with God. There's a great book called Acedia, which is the Greek version of the word sloth. Acedia, the Noonday Devil uh, by Abbot Jean-Charles Nault. And uh, he goes through a kind of a historical, the first half is a historical appraisal of this question. In the, in the very early Christian writings, the, the monks talk about it's a the desire to leave your cell right to flee from where you're at right now because that's not enjoyable to you and like you said you don't want to 
you don't want to put the work in to make it enjoyable because it's also built on the lie. It's either built on the lie that God's not here, so I got to go find him, or the lie that God doesn't want me to be happy and so I shouldn't spend time with him. And we, those are the uh, acknowledging <laughs> and relating. We have to acknowledge those things at certain times. Say, Jesus, you're not enough for me right now. I'd rather be doing a thousand other things than spending time with you. And that way we can get out to the appropriate person, for him, good. who's not going to be offended or sad, right? He's going to say, great, well, let's work Perfect. on that. You got it. But you got it, to do that, you got to stay in the cell. And what does this mean? Sometimes leaving the cell means, uh, you know, laziness. So that's a part of sloth. But a lot of times, and what afflicts us much more than laziness, is hyperactivity. Yeah. I'm busy. I can't tell you how many times I hear the phrase, I'm busy. Well, why are you busy? Almost certainly because you want to be busy. We, I think, you know, we, we tend, <laughs> if we have $10, we tend to spend 11 of them. And if we have 24 hours in a day, we book out 25. We just go a little bit more than we can handle, right? But we choose that. That's right. So, like you said, with technology and everything, how, is my day, the 24 hours of my day are booked such that I can't do the things that I really want to? Or have we booked the day with the things that we really want to and then we can't squeeze in the things that we actually don't want to in the end anyway? <laughs> that's right. I'm not busy, I'm disordered. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's, it's a, that that's a good, good t-shirt. <laughs> I'm busy, I'm disordered. <laughs> I'm disordered. My priorities are disordered. Right. It's priorities. Um, and which, right, it, you just spoke an incredible irony. A slothful world is busyness. Yeah. A slothful world is how, how do you what does a slothful world look like it looks like to prepare for christmas you don't enter into the silent and slow quiet pace of nazareth yeah. and bethlehem you get real busy yeah so this this uh, uh cd as you say the hermits right it's it's amazing how much the hermits talked about the real issue right. is sloth and what what is what is sloth about? Sloth is about trying is is always about moving moving me into a culture of distraction, yeah. an addiction to being distracted. Why? Because this experience of mine, which which is so different than I want it to be, and in many cases different than what. I, my convictions of faith say it should be, mm -hmm. is too painful to yes. deal with. Yeah. I want to, f I want a close friendship with God. I want a close relationship with God. I want, I want him to be real for me right. and he's not. And I don't control this space and that makes me nervous. I don't know what to do. Right. Um, and so it's not worth the effort. I'm going to put all my energy into this, etc., into being a good person. Right, <laughs> right. Into being nice. Making the world a better place. Making the world a better place. Serving people. All of those, of course, in themselves are fine. But the point right. is, it's not Christian relationship with God. No. It's pagan. It is virtuous. Paganism. Right. And we can think about this too in like all sorts of medical analogies. You know, if you have, uh, if your appendix hurts, that's like an objectively not a pleasant experience, right? We, we don't want that. And so what, what can you do? You can take Advil, you know, you can take, uh, you, you can take long walks or put in headphones to distract you. You can do all sorts of stuff. Sure. Nevertheless, what, are, what you're doing isn't dealing with the problem. You're either distracting yourself or medicating the problem. Well, this is a direct analogy to the spiritual life. We, we, have, we have some pain, we have some discomfort, we have something going wrong. And so we can choose to go to the doctor, which is annoying, embarrassing, inconvenient, sometimes expensive, it takes sacrifice. Or we can just distract ourselves and medicate, right? Yep. But, but during that whole process, what's happening to your body is you're dying, right? Yeah. And eventually it could, it's gonna reach, <laughs> that's why when we have breakdowns and meltdowns and, and sort of the whole, our, our whole world's, well, that's just the appendix rupturing. You got it. You know, our spiritual appendix just finally gave out and you can't, you come to a point where no amount of distraction or, or, or medication, like, you know, and by medication, I mean, you know, the classic, like, uh, alcohol, drugs, Sorry. you know, TV, whatever, social media, Sorry. beauty. You just described in that analogy how one chooses on a medical, physical level 
not to receive good that they need for health, right? And that is, I don't acknowledge my need and bring it to the doctor. Right. Th this is precisely what Christian prayer is all about. Yeah. I acknowledge my need and I bring it to him. Yeah. And if I'm not doing that, I am uh, precisely avoiding uh, this whole place of receiving God. Because the intersection, the intersection where God's loving, good, all-powerful will and you and I meet, where He encounters us, where we receive, is at the intersection of human need. What made God leap down from heaven, empty Himself and become a little baby? His concern for our need It was not our virtue that brought him down. No. His attraction to need. What makes a doctor go to his office every day? The, the medical needs of, of his people. Yeah. What makes a priest sit yeah. in a confessional? Yeah. And so, I mean, talk about good news. Jesus says, right, the, sick, uh, the healthy don't need a good doctor, the sick do. Um, and he says that to the Pharisees who don't know how to receive from him because they won't actually acknowledge right, right, right. their need yep. and bring it to Jesus. So um, I, I try to, I try to um, get the kids to be utterly convinced that where this God who is always giving himself, where Niagara Falls is happening, right, where... Um, yeah, Niagara Falls is happening for them where the sun is always shining and we simply need to open the curtains to receive it or open our mouths to drink it is where you have a need, your greatest need, or <coughs> I think for college kids what would be helpful, unfulfilled desire. If they walked into prayer every day asking this question, what is the thing I'd like to change but can't? The thing I'd like yeah. to control, <coughs> excuse me, the thing I'd like to control but can't, the thing I'd like to make happen but can't, especially about me. If they walked into the chapel thinking that question, if I had a magic wand, I'd change this. Yeah. If I had a magic wand, I would control this. If I had a magic wand, I would make this happen. If they enter into that place with acknowledging and relating that is precisely where the God who is pure act and God is love is pouring himself. And now they receive more and more and enter into the encounter with him. Yeah. Most of us, right, are uncomfortable with that space. Most of us are uncomfortable with this place of need, shame, resentment, frustration. Yeah self-loathing, self-condemnation, self-rejection, hopelessness, all those things come at us if we stand in that place. <clears throat> Thus, the need to actively reject, right. acknowledge, and relay. No, it's not easy. Christian relational prayer is not easy precisely because um, all of these, uh, we're, we're not just, we're not just coming before God and that's it. Yeah. There's all kinds of other stuff that's resisting this, um, encounter.